right, what you got a little preview with Teo praying in Spanish there. That's what our 930 service is like for those listening on the, uh, in their ears. We have an app that our Spanish-speaking brothers listen to everything translated live. So if that's felt weird to you, just think about our brothers and sisters, how they feel <laughs> every week. So, uh, hey, grab your Bibles, open them up to 2 Samuel chapter 7, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, it's after 1 Samuel, if you get lost, Okay. That was a pastor joke. Anyways, 2 Samuel chapter 7. We are in week three of a series called Let Earth Receive Her King, our Advent focus this year. Each week we're looking at an ancient promise that was fulfilled in Christ and what that means for us today. So each week we're kind of tack, tracking one promise that was made many, many years ago and how that was fulfilled in Christ, and now what is the current day ramification. So we want to do more than just sing Christmas carols this Christmas or decorate our houses, although that's great and I love it as much as the next guy. But we're asking ourselves in this series, what does it mean to receive Jesus as King? We talk about receiving him as our Savior and Lord, that he died and rose again, but what does it mean to receive him as your king and to live with him as your king? And, and so that's what we want to talk about. And you remember we gave you a little overview of the series. Here's kind of the six weeks of messages thus far. We've talked about how Jesus was the serpent crusher in week one who gives us victory over the evil one. But we need to bring that victory home to our very homes like the hobbits in the Lord of the Rings, to bring it back into our homes and, and to surrender to be transformed by this King Jesus and to celebrate the light everywhere. And side note, how's it going not complaining for six weeks? Not so well, is it? Okay. Yeah, the struggle is real. Uh, and then last week, Pastor Matt Boyers talked about how Jesus is the son of Abraham, the one who would bring God's promises to all nations. God's promise was never to stay with Israel, but to bless the nations through the nation of Israel and Abraham's line and seed. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ as he brought the Holy Spirit to us. And all we had to do was ask him. And this week, we tackle week three of this series with a key idea about how Jesus is the son of David the son of David. What does that mean? And why was that so important? Did you know that that's the number one name that everyone in the first century used to talk to Jesus? In fact, when random blind people would see Jesus, they would say, son of David, son of David. So everyone called Jesus this. What did it mean? And why was that so important? So that's what we're going to investigate today from 2 Samuel chapter 7 to look at where that title began. Now, before we read it, just a little background on the Bible. If you're not really familiar with David, David was, in Israelite history, the most famous king in all of Israel. He was their favorite king. You know how all of us kind of think, oh, we need to go back to the glory days of when things were great or whatever. Every Israelite would have thought of the days of David and his son Solomon as their glory days. The pinnacle of Israelite civilization was under the ruling of David and then his son Solomon who built the temple. The Israelite was wealthy. Uh, Israel was wealthy and at peace. But it wasn't always that way. David was promised to be king when he was just a little teenager in the 15-year-old range and he was shepherding sheep. And God promised that he would be a king. And we're familiar with his famous battle with Goliath when he took on G when Goliath when he was just a teenager. But David faced resistance in his kingship from a guy named Saul who wanted to kill David because Saul was the king at the time and didn't like that this punk teenager had been this promised king. And so Saul tried to kill David for 15 years. But where we're picking it up in the story is that Saul has passed away. David is now the king. Israel is at peace. The Ark of the Covenant has come back home. And David is sitting in his, his castle or his palace, if you will, and he begins to think to himself, I want to build God a house. So David says at the beginning of this chapter, I, I, what am I doing sitting in this house with cedar walls and God's Ark of the Covenant is in a little tent, which we call the tabernacle. I want to build him a house. It sounds like a noble idea. And then God speaks to David something way bigger than David could ever have imagined. And that's what we're going to read together in our text this morning. So if you are able with me, I know you just got seated, but let's stand in honor of the reading of God's word. 2 Samuel 7, for those of you that are new to Crossroads, we stand to, to signify authority, just like a judge or anyone else that has authority who enters the room, we all rise. So, starting in verse 8, this is God's words back to David about wanting to build his house. Now then, 
Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now, I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they, will, they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppose them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that, all, that the Lord will do the, himself will do this and establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He's talking about his son Solomon here. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him and with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And here's the big promise. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire uh, revelation. Then David, King David, went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord? And what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if this were not enough in your sight, sovereign Lord, you have spoken about the future of the house of your servant, and this decree, sovereign Lord, is for a mere human. And we'll stop there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, you may be seated. A mere human. Now, in this passage, I want to just kind of walk through it uh, to show you the promise that God makes, the fulfillment of how Jesus fulfills this promise as the Son of David, and then finally, so what? How do we apply this to our lives in 21st century? What does this mean, right? The promise, the fulfillment, and the application. Let's start with the promise. Isn't it amazing that as you read this passage, David is pondering how he can build God a house, and God actually totally flips that around through the prophet Nathan and says, no, you think you're going to build me a house, but I am going to build you a house. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that like God that his plans are like way better than we ever thought they were, right? Ephesians 3.20 says that he could do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine. Just think about the smallness of David's plan. David has this big plan of building a temple. And to be sure, that was great. And the temple would be built through his son Solomon. And in 1 Kings 6-9, through 9, you can read about how this temple was so huge and wonderful and glorious. But temples come and go, right? We know that the temple Solomon built was destroyed eventually when they went into captivity. Then it was rebuilt with Nehemiah. Then it was destroyed again. And then it was probably rebuilt with Herod. And then it was destroyed again. And that's what you see in Jerusalem today, just one wall of the temple remaining. So temples come and go, but God was promising David something way bigger than just a mere building. God promises David in verses 8 through 11 that he wants to give his people rest, rest from their enemies and their labors. He, he also promises him that he would be with his son Solomon, uh, who would be the one to build the temple. But most importantly, in verse 16, God promises David a monumental gift. He says, this kingdom will endure forever before me, that someone in your lineage would rule forever. So David asks God for a bucket of water, and God gives him an ocean. That's the promise. In a nutshell, David wants to build God a house, but God says, I will build you an eternal house. I will build you an eternal house. You want to build me a temple, I'm going to build an eternal dwelling for my people and for your kingdom. I love the sheer grace of God in this. Verse 11 says, the Lord himself will do this. This is not a work that David would do or that David had earned. David was just a shepherd boy, shepherding sheep when God found him. Rather, it is God's absolute grace that he would accomplish this through David. God wants to build a home for his people where they would worship him freely and without danger, a home that would last forever, as verses 8 through 11 say, where they could have peace and joy and praise God and worship him forever. Now, just a side note, this is why we should pray for peace in Jerusalem in our day. I'm sure it grieves God's heart that the nation of Israel is far from him, 
They have rejected Jesus as their Messiah, and now they are in deep pain and war and agony. And so we, as, as God's people, should pray for peace in Israel, pray for the nation, pray for their nation to come to faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of David they have been longing for. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So you see in David's response in verse 18 and 19 just how blown away he is. Can you imagine getting this promise from God? What would you say? And David's immediate response is, who am I? Why would you give me this promise? And you've brought me thus far. You've already made me king as I was just a shepherd, and now you're promising me an eternal house? Who am I that I should deserve this? And that's the point. He doesn't. He doesn't deserve it. It's a gift of God's grace. And the one who would fulfill this promise wouldn't be a mere human at all. One more powerful verse before we move on. The prophet Jeremiah, years later after David and Solomon had died, Jeremiah says this. This is several years later. Is the promise going to be fulfilled? Well, here's what Jeremiah said. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will no longer come at their appointed times, which means the world would be over, Then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites who are priests ministering before me can be broken, and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on his throne. In other words, God doubles down on his promise and says, when day and night stop happening, then my promise will be broken. I am going to fulfill this promise. David will have someone that would reign on his throne forever. And this was just a few years before what we are reading in the New Testament. So, The question is, who would this descendant be? Who is the son of David who would sit on the throne? Answer, church, Jesus. That was not a hard question. Good answer, though, gold star. All right, Jesus. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the son of David. He is the long-awaited Messiah, the king. And don't take my word for it, though. There are several texts in the Scripture, and all these are in your bulletin, but here's just a smattering of them that tell this truth. Here it is, Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's read that again. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus is not only the son of Abraham like we looked at last week, but he is the son of David. Here's the Apostle Paul in Romans 1, the gospel life promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus was of the lineage of David, but he wasn't merely human. He was the son of God as well. So he would be the perfect mixture of David's line and yet the eternal king is the only one. Something greater than David has come. And this is exactly what Jesus said in Mark chapter 12. Jesus says this, Jesus addresses this title directly in one of his teachings. While Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, he asked, why do the teachers of the law say the Messiah is the son of David? So he's saying, why do you call me this? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, and he's quoting Psalm 110 here, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? The large crowd listened to him with delight. And what Jesus is saying here is, if you think David is great, David calls the Messiah his Lord, meaning he's above him, not just a son that's descended from him, but the son of David is greater than David himself. Now, every Jewish person thought of David as like their king of kings. And what Jesus is saying here is, no, I'm a whole different level above him. And finally, in Revelation, Jesus, in John's vision, in the book of Revelation, the very end of the Bible, he says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come, let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. So at the very end of the Bible, you have Jesus reiterating this promise that God made to David back in 2 Samuel 7, that I am him, I am the one. And I have come to establish a kingdom, and anyone and everyone is invited to partake and find satisfaction and thirst quenched and life and meaning and purpose, and only can find that in me. So Christ fulfills the promise majestically. God promised David an eternal house, but Jesus promises us a forever kingdom. Jesus is building a forever kingdom, 
a kingdom that would last for all time. And this kingdom would be received the same way that David's kingdom was received. It would be totally by God's grace. You don't have to try out to be a part of this kingdom or be born in the right place to be a part of this kingdom. There's no performance bar to make it. It's not earned by anything we've done. Ephesians 2 says, for grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves so that no one should boast. The kingdom of God is a gift so that no one can brag about themselves. The only person we brag about in the kingdom of Jesus is Jesus. Again, easy answer, gold star. Good job. It's not a kingdom of self-promotion, it's a kingdom of Jesus promotion. And this kingdom would be to give us rest. Just like God promised David that he wanted to build a place for his people to have rest, that's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus comes as this Davidic king who wants to build a place where his people can find rest from their labors and their pains and to worship freely with him. And yet this is still, there is still more to come because God said he wants to build a forever kingdom and a house that would last forever where his people would be free from all of their enemies. One day, Revelation predicts that God will do that. And this is what Jesus promised in John chapter 14. He says it like this, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me also, that you will be with me where I am. So Jesus makes this promise that he is building this forever kingdom, and he has gone off now to rebuild an eternal dwelling, and that one day he will come back and his people will dwell with him in beauty and peace and joy. This is the promise. This is the great promise God made to David, and this is the amazing fulfillment that happens in Jesus Christ, that he is ruling and reigning and building his forever kingdom. This is the king that we receive. Now, we could sing songs about that, we can applaud that, but what does that mean for you tomorrow? That's what you really are asking. What does this mean for me this week when I go to work? What does this mean when I face holidays? What does this mean when I face an uncertain world or the next day? How does Jesus building his kingdom forever affect me when I have to face holidays without my loved one that just passed? How does it help me face the year 2024, which is probably going to be the most tumultuous years in our country's history as there's another one of those elections again? Woohoo! Right? How do I face all of that? How do, I, how do I endure hardship? How do I endure, endure wars and see the news and all the trouble that's going on in our world and not get depressed and anxious? Yeah, Matt, how does, ruling, how does Jesus ruling and reigning in a forever kingdom change my life? That's the question. Well, here's the answer. Here's the application. Receive your king and live in the reality of his kingdom. And that's the application of all these messages, to live in the reality of what we're saying And I want to give you a simple, simple attitude application. You do that by humbly obeying and relaxing. Humbly obey and relax. And all of these come really straight from what God promised David. First, humbly. It starts with humility. To live in the kingdom of Jesus, remember, this kingdom is not earned It is not something you work for or fight for or prove you're worthy of. No, the gospel is a gift. We are saved by grace through faith. Remember, we looked at in week one that we were serpents. We were the serpent's kids and that Jesus Christ had to rescue us while we were enemies. Christ died for us. This means that anyone who is living in the kingdom of Jesus should be breathing in and out the air of humility. There is no place for boasting or arrogance in the kingdom of Jesus. And if you have not been humbled by the gospel, then I don't know if you understand it. But that's actually good news. Humility, true humility, is a beautiful virtue, and it can only be created by the gospel. Because the gospel humbles you without crushing you. The gospel humbles you, but it doesn't crush you. Now, there's many other things in this life that can humble us, right? 
I'm sure we've all had those experiences in our life where we've been humbled, right? I remember when I was 13 and I got cut from that travel basketball team. That was a humbling experience for me, and I was super depressed. My 13-year-old self thought life was over, right? And you all know what that feels like in your junior high ages, being depressed. Or maybe that guy or that girl broke up with you and your heart was shattered into a million pieces. It will get better, teenager, trust me. But on maybe a little bit deeper note, maybe you didn't get that job that you always wanted. Somebody else got it or that promotion. Or maybe you didn't get the financial uh, portfolio. Or maybe something bad happened to you. Maybe you had a really difficult circumstance in your life. Maybe you went through a divorce. Maybe you went through some deeply painful circumstances and it humbled you. And quite honestly, it crushed you. We all know the feeling of being humbled, but what the gospel does is it humbles us and it lifts us up at the same time. Because in the gospel, you and I are more sinful than we could ever dare imagine. We are beyond personal repair. We can't fix ourselves, which is extremely humbling. And yet at the same time, we are more loved than we could ever dare hope to be. You're both of those at the same time in the gospel, which keeps you and gives you true humility. It's like a smelling salts for either form of pride, either inflated pride or wounded pride. The gospel heals both. Let me show you. James chapter 1. This is one of my favorite passages to memorize or to think about. This is Jesus' brother James when he wrote, he said, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like the, the wild flower. See, he's using the word pride twice, but he's actually talking about humility. You know what this means? What James is saying here is that if you are a believer and you are feeling really down, you're feeling poor, maybe you're literally poor, maybe you're homeless, maybe you don't have the nice things that everyone else has, maybe you're feeling unloved or hurt, maybe you're poor relationally and, and your family's broken, maybe your marriage is struggling or in shambles, maybe you're feeling like life has just got you down and you're feeling beaten down. Remember who you are in Jesus Christ. That you, a mere human, has been granted access to the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are a son or daughter of God, and you have the rights as his kids. Remember that when life has you depressed, where your high position is in Jesus Christ, and let that lift you up out of that false humility. But on the other hand, when you're rich... Maybe you're monetarily rich. Maybe you have really nice possessions. Maybe you have more money than you ever thought. Maybe you have that dream job. Maybe you have that dream vacation. When you win the championship, when you ace that test, when you feel pretty amazing about yourself and love the way you look and, and you have that body type that you've always wanted or maybe you love flexing in the mirror like my teenage son. I don't know if that's you, but sorry, Jack. Love you. Every teenage guy, I think, does that. I don't know why it is. Like, six pack. Yeah. Right? Whatever. What does God's word say to you if you're feeling really high about yourself? Remember your humiliation. Remember your sin. Remember that apart from Jesus Christ, you are nothing. You are an enemy of God that is desperately in need of a Savior. That everything in your life is a gift. The very breath in your lungs could be gone tomorrow. Remember that so you don't ever get too high about yourself. Which one do you need to be reminded of today? Your high position or your humiliation? Ask the Lord to remind you, and he'll let you walk humbly before your God. So knowing Jesus' kingdom, this forever kingdom, is by grace, it keeps you humble. But not only does it keep you humble, it lets you walk in obedience. We obey, we humbly obey because Jesus is king. And when Jesus asks us to do things, we say, yes, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. Our posture is one of gratitude and obedience. We're just ready to do whatever our master calls us to do. It's not about accolades. It's not about being better than other people because that's not what got us in this thing. We're just here to serve Jesus. And I love David in our text, right? In, in 2 Samuel 7, David wants to build God a temple. That was a great goal. It was a great, great goal. And God says, no. God says, no. In fact, David, your son is going to build the temple, and your job is going to be to gather all the supplies for the temple. So David spent the rest of his life gathering supplies. <laughs> You're the supply gatherer. Your son Solomon is going to be the temple builder. But God had better plans in mind. 
God was going to call David to be the, the, the Davidic line through which the Messiah would come. That wasn't what David had in mind, but it was better. And friend, God has better in mind for you, even if it's not what you thought. God can do immeasurably more, and it's okay if no one knows about it. It's okay if no one knows about it. You may not be called to be the temple builder. You may not be called to do the glamorous job that, that maybe you've been dreaming about or maybe you've wanted for so long. God might have a different plan in store for you, but I could promise you it will be better than what you thought. This is why I love the story of Joseph in the nativity story. We talked about this a little bit last year, but for those of you that weren't here, Joseph played a massive role, but yet he's a relatively anonymous character. In fact, if you have like nativity sets in your house, if Joseph goes missing, you're like, eh, whatever. It's just Joseph, right? As long as we have Mary and baby Jesus and shepherds and wise men, we're good. You know, Joseph gets a bad rap. All Joseph did in the, in the nativity is had a couple dreams where he didn't divorce Mary and he adopted Jesus, which the angel told him to do. And then he saved Jesus from the genocide of Herod. Those are kind of big deals, but that's what Joseph did. And then after that, you never hear him again. But Joseph played a massive role in the story of Jesus because if Joseph had not adopted Jesus as his son, Jesus would not be the son of David. And yet no one knows a thing about Joseph. And I think if Joseph were in heaven, right? Well, he is in heaven. And I think he's just like, that's cool. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And friend, when you are in the kingdom of Jesus, that's the posture. You can be just like Joseph. It's not about me. I'm just going to use whatever I have to magnify and glorify Jesus Christ. I don't have to be jealous of other people. I don't know what role God has asked you to play. Maybe you're discouraged by it. Maybe you wish you had a better role. Maybe you wish you had a better voice or a better body or a better job. Whatever God calls you to do is good. So do it well for the glory of God. I love 1 Corinthians 15. This is what Paul says at the end of his big resurrection chapter as he's giving us hope for the future that Jesus is going to come back and his kingdom will be forever. This is what he says, the very last verse of 15. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, in light of everything I've just said, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Nothing you do in the Lord's name is worthless. Everything matters. Every diaper you change, every meal you cook, every day you go to work, all of those things done for the glory of God, they matter. So you can humbly obey Jesus. And finally, and maybe my most favorite part of this application is relax. You can humbly obey and relax. Relax, friend, because the king is on his throne. And he never left. In this tumultuous and stressful world full of scary things and a, hundred, and a thousand things that we should be worried about, when you know that Jesus is building a forever kingdom and that nothing can stop his kingdom from coming and nothing can shake the foundations of his kingdom, not even the gates of hell, you can relax in that. Jesus wants to give you and I rest from your anxieties and our fears are you feeling worried or anxious today? Did you wake up or sleep, have sleepless nights because something is stressing you out? Hear this word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 12. This is from the end, kind of the promise of what's going to happen. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. He's talking about God, the king. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth. He's talking about when Jesus was here. How much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate that, hold on, go back to that, sorry, I was reading that. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, now go. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. And here's the promise. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You know what this verse is saying? It's saying at the end of time, God is going to take the world and shakes things up. He's going to shake it up. All evil, all hell, the devil himself, it's all going to be shaken and torn away. 
God is going to shake all the things in this world. And if you read the book of Revelation, there's a lot of shaking going on, earthquakes and wars and disasters and famine and all of it. And God is going to shake it all up. But there's one thing that will not be shaken, and that's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And friend, when you know that, when you know that, when you know that you're part of an unshakable kingdom, it changes everything about your, your, your state of being. You can relax. I don't have to be afraid about tomorrow. Do you ever wonder what's going to happen tomorrow? What if so-and-so gets elected? What if this law passes? What if this happens? What if that happens? All of those burdens can be laid at King Jesus' feet. If I truly believe this, I can relinquish control of my anxieties because what is anxiety at its core? It's me trying to control what I actually can't control, and I'm stressed to the max about it. Honestly, if we just believe this one truth, that Jesus is ruling and reigning on his throne, our anxieties would be relieved, and I'm saying that as a person who has a lot of them. I don't have to take control over every detail in my life. I don't have to make my own future. Jesus is in control of my future, and my anxiety can be released into his hands. This, this past week, I had the privilege of meeting and visiting a brother in Christ from our church who's struggling with cancer. And he's in a bad way. His body's very weak. He's hurting a lot. And I had opportunity to read the Bible with him and pray. And we started talking about, like, how do you have hope in the midst of cancer? In the midst of the unknowns of how long you're going to live and how long it's going to last. And are you going to recover or are you going to die an early death? And how do you face that? And then we started pondering this truth that Jesus is the forever king. And I asked him, I said, in 10,000 years, do you think it's going to matter whether you had cancer or not? And he said, no. Do you think you'll even remember it in like 20,000 years? Probably not. So when you have that perspective that Jesus is king and that he's ruling and reigning now and he will in 10,000 years or in 20,000 years, it changes how you think about your present circumstances. It changes how you face cancer. It changes how you face your greatest fears in this life. When you know that Jesus is king, you can relax. And it was awesome to see my brother and his heart just be at peace as he was pondering who Jesus is. That's just real. That's a real conversation from this week from a brother in Christ who's a part of this church that is dealing with devastating effects of cancer. We don't have to rely on ourselves. We don't have to rely on our health. We don't have to rely on our skills. I don't have to worry about comparing my skills with anybody else. I don't have to be jealous of your gifts or envious of your gifts. I can rejoice in those gifts because we're all on the same team. We're just helping one another uh, get to heaven and glorifying Jesus along the way. I don't have to be afraid of evil like we looked at in week one. Jesus has already conquered the devil and has given me a high position of authority over him and confidence in Jesus Christ. So I don't have to be afraid of the darkness in our world because Christ has overcome the world. I can trust his justice. In the most simple sense, whenever you feel shaken, you know what I mean. Whenever you feel literally like you're shaking because you're afraid or you feel shaken at your core. Maybe you lost something or someone. Maybe you're just dealing with something that's really hard. Maybe you're a parent and your kids aren't doing what you want them to do, and it shakes you. Whenever you feel shaken, here's what you do. You go into the throne room of Jesus and you just say, can you just hold me, Jesus? (laughs) Because I'm shaking and I need you to hold me still. That's what you do. And you know what? Jesus welcomes you in. And he says, come into the throne of grace when you need time, in your time of need. This is what God offers us, and this is how you relax. And guess what? When other people see you relax, when other people see you be humble and obey, they begin to ask questions. How in the world are you okay when everything in your life is shattered? And you could say, Jesus, because he's on the throne. How in the world do you not care that so-and-so got the promotion over you? Jesus, because it's not about me. If God wants me to have that job, I'll get it. If he doesn't want me to have that job, I'll be okay with whatever Jesus gives me. 
That's what 1 Peter 3 says, right? To, give, to be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks you for the hope you have in you. When you begin to live like this, humbly, obedient, and relaxing, the world will take notice and they will ask, why are you like this? And you can tell them. So we've seen that God made a big promise to David. Oh man, it was big. And that he would build an eternal house. And we've seen how Christ has fulfilled that and is ruling and reigning now. And the question you and I have to answer for ourselves is, will we receive him? Will we live in light of Jesus' rule and reign? Will we walk in humility and obey and play whatever part God tells us to play, whether it's a temple builder or a supply gatherer? Will we do it all? And will we do it all while we're relaxed and at rest? I can't answer that for you. That's something you got to rest in yourself. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths of who Jesus is, the son of David that he is the promised Messiah, the promised King who would rule and reign forever. And that Jesus, your kingdom will never, ever be shaken. And so when I am shaking, I can go into your presence and find myself stilled and comforted. Just like a child who runs into their parents' arms when they're terrified and finds security, oh God, you are our security. And we rest in you. And you call us to have faith like a child. So we will come into your presence like little children and ask you to calm our souls. Ask you to be the one who, who steadies us in the midst of a world that's shaking. Oh God, make us this. And we respond now and ponder who is this child that was born in Bethlehem that would come to save us that would come to establish a kingdom that would last forever. So we respond now in praise and worship to you as your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.